Um, so lately, for the last several years, there have been all of these headlines um, about, um, oh my gosh, a million Chinese in Africa, as if that were such a huge number, right? And um, my question to you, to the room, is, is, is that really something we should be worried about or concerned about? Is it a, a big number um, as such? Certainly, um, Howard French is one amongst many who's kind of uh, profited off of almost sensationalizing that number, right? Um, and alluding to the fact that the presence of all of these Chinese um, is about Chinese empire building, about neo-colonial um, kind of Chinese intentions on the African continent. Um, I think it's always important to put those numbers in context. Um, so first of all, um, I think most of you who study Africa understand that any numbers about um, coming out of home affairs departments um, are notoriously unreliable. Um, and, and it's important to see the numbers in context. So a million Chinese out of a population of now you know, over 1.2 billion um, on the continent. Internally, Chinese are moving and it's mostly you know, um, rural urban migration, but upwards of 155, you know, people are saying it's gonna be well over 200 million um, within China, moving from rural to urban areas, right? And a total population of 1.379 billion. Um, the numbers of ethnic Chinese um, in the US that includes new migrants and Chinese Americans um, and also Taiwanese, right? Almost 5 million um, in the 2015 census, census, right? And then we were talking over lunch about, um, you know, other foreigners in Africa, right? So in South Africa alone, um, there are estimates of over 3 million Zimbabweans just in South Africa. So that kind of gives you a sense of the numbers in some kind of context, right? The other thing is when um, the numbers of Chinese are, in, are reported, um, oftentimes the numbers are inflated. So um, a young woman, Hannah Postel, who um, did a Fulbright um, research project in Zambia, actually sat down with home affairs kind of um, applications and, and all of their numbers. And she wrote a couple pieces about this. but. Um, in her findings and the um, popular estimates in the media, they were saying it was 80,000, 100,000 Chinese in Zambia. Um, her findings, it was closer to 13,000. That's what she had documented. So the numbers are highly exaggerated. In another incident that I came across directly, um, there was a um, Institute for Migration Studies report that came out and it indicated that there were 40,000 Chinese in Namibia. Now Namibia is a population with less than 2 million um, of population. So the idea of 40,000 Chinese suddenly in Namibia was a huge deal. When I went to do research um, in 2009, we started asking around and we asked you know, people in government, people in the Chinese embassy, and it looked like the number was closer to 4,000 not 40,000, right? So what likely happened was there was a typo and there was an extra zero added. But now that's the number that gets publicized because of the internet. It's all over the place, right? Um, another recent article indicated there were as many as 100,000 Chinese in, in um, Africa. Um, and the Minister of Home Affairs recently reported that the numbers have gone up to maybe 7,000. So again, it's, it's you know, don't pay heed too much to the numbers. Um, what these exaggerations might indicate is something worth researching, um, but it also leads to kind of further concerns about you know this and 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 the words that are used to describe um, the numbers of Chinese moving onto the continent is indicative of these concerns, right? There's a deluge of, of, or a flood of, of Chinese, you know, there, there's an invasion of Chinese. And these are words that you typically find in articles um, covering this. The final kind of caveat about the numbers is anyone who looks like this is Chinese. Doesn't matter if, um, if, you know, I, I, and for years I could scream and jump until I was red in the face, right, and saying, but I'm Korean and American. Oh, so what part of China? <laughs> so.
<laughs> didn't matter. Like, I, and it got so bad at one point, um, I was talking to another, um, I, I was leaving a message for a woman who lived in one of the um, informal settlements in South Africa. We're getting ready to give a donation. And um, this woman, Sophie, knew me, but I was speaking to her daughter, and her daughter didn't know who I was. And so I, I said to her, and in presence of my, my husband who was listening to me, I said, tell Sophie it's the Chinese lady who's calling. <laughs> <laughs> my husband looked at him because I can't believe you just referred to yourself as Chinese. But I said, if I said I'm Korean, she wouldn't know what that was. Just so anyway, OK. Um, so I wanted to do this presentation in two parts. And there are just lots of images to show you. Um, but the first um, part really is to kind of reiterate um, the, the point that um, Chinese in Africa is not a completely new phenomenon. There have been Chinese in Africa before the 2000s, you know, before 2005. Um, and it's something that a lot of people who are currently writing about it don't realize, that there is a history um, be of relations, of ties between China and Africa, um, and that there have been Chinese people on the continent before. Um, so um, what I want to try to kind of get at are both continuities as well as disjunctures in terms of the history of these flows, right? Um, there's a long history of Chinese labor in Africa. Um, this is a postcard of some of the Chinese uh, indentured mine workers that were um, imported from China um, and from parts of northern China to the Witwatersrand to um, work the gold mines. Um, there were close to 64,000 Chinese mine workers that were imported under um, these contracts between the Chinese government and, um, um, and uh, the mine magnets, um, the mining magnets. And um, this happened in the period immediately after the Anglo-Boer War when um, they, the um, Rand mine lords weren't able to get the Africans, who mostly from the surrounding areas, but also from South Africa, to return to the mines at the conclusion of the war. Um, so they went around and did research and looked into all different kinds of, of um, labor um, possibilities, and they ended up in the north of China, um, imported these guys. Um, this whole incident, there are papers written about the Chinese in the mines, um, in the gold mines, um, caused all kinds of political problems in Britain and in South Africa. Um, it didn't last very long. From 1904 by, by 1910, um, all of the Chinese had been sent back, either, you know, um, uh, in, in, on, on their two legs, um, one in 20 died on the mines, the disease, violence, accidents, um, and things like that. But um, this was the largest such project to import labor, but there were many others. Every single colonial power in Africa at the time had some kind of project or another to import Chinese labor. So some of the um, groups that were sent were much smaller, but there were Chinese that were involved in constructing railroads and ports and, um, and roads throughout the continent, um, and, um, and also running um, uh, plantations um, and farms. Today, typically, you see um, both contract workers working typically on Chinese construction projects, um, as well as um, in Ghana, we were talking earlier, um, illegal miners, um, and um, all kinds of labor um, that you'll see throughout um, the continent. Um, Chinese companies um, and labor uh, is, is a huge issue. The two main complaints are either that Chinese don't hire locals, they don't hire enough locals, that they're bringing in their own Chinese workers to do things like push wheelbarrows and, um, and um, a lot of these people then end up, you know, selling corn, mealy roasted corn on the street or, or fry bread. Um, and in most African countries that have huge problems with unemployment, this is an issue. Um, if it's not about Chinese bringing in their own labor. The complaints are about Chinese firms and their labor practices, that when they do hire, they're creating um, 
kind of the lowest end jobs and that they're not abiding by um, labor policies, that they that the that they're the worst employers. There was a Human Rights Watch report, for example, that looked at um, a number of mines in the Zambian Copper Belt, and they came to the conclusion, mind you, without ever having talked to any other employers of any other nationality, but they concluded that the Chinese were the worst. Um, so there, there have been other um, pro similar um, kind of reports along those lines, but that you know th this is one of the the touchstones really of issues that that um, comes up again and again and again. Um, and the other rumor myth that kind of accompanies a lot of these uh, discourses about Chinese labor or Chinese and workers is that Chinese are importing um, prisoners or, or slaves to do the work on these um, com construction companies. Um, there, there have been scholarly research into this is patently false. There are no Chinese prisoners or slaves brought in, but the fact that all Chinese come in, they wear the same kind of coveralls, they work super long hours, they live on enclosed compounds, um, they don't have any, you know, very little interaction with local communities. You can understand why some of those myths and rumors would um, come up. And actually, if you think about you know, the history in the country of indentured labor, it might make sense that in people's minds, this is the same thing happening over again. The Chinese are bringing in their own people and working them to death on these projects. Um, in the Chinese narrative, um, the Chinese are there to help, right? And starting in the um, late 50s, 60s, China's relationships um, with African countries actually had to do with um, supporting liberation struggles. Um, and um, even while China was still itself a developing country, they actually gave um, a lot of aid and assistance, um, particularly in the decade of the 60s, to African countries. One of the most famous things that they did was they sent medical teams. Um, and they're still kind of um, memories that are very fresh in, um, in the minds of, of many Africans, I think, of Chinese bush doctors who had very good reputations. Um, and, and this was the way, China, this is the way con still that China continues to kind of uh, create their narrative of, of their engagement with Africa, that it's about solidarity, that it's about brother, uh, comrades, uh, brothers in arms, and support. Um, in the struggle against, you know, the imperial West, <clears throat> and you still see this this continuing legacy of solidarity and support. So there are Chinese doctors and scientists and development workers, and not huge numbers, but scattered throughout the continent. In addition, um, however, there are also increasingly um, large numbers of independent Chinese migrants who are moving um, to China and they're working on farms. Um, um, and th these independent migrants are also kind of, you know, linked to Chinese in the past. These were um, Chinese men who were living in South Africa um, in the, at the turn of the last century. Um, they all participated in the passive resistance movement that had been started by Gandhi. Um, and it was very important for them to present themselves as respectable, civilized members of society, right? And so there's a history of independent migrants um, as well. Um, these days, um, many of the guys that come, guys, women who come are um, of much more modest means. Um, uh, in the Chinese literature, you might refer to them as peasants. Um, in Southern Africa, the vast majority come from Fujian province, and they come from one or two particular areas of Fujian province. Um, and uh, they work in grocery stores, um, in little, what, what in, in the China-Africa literature we refer to as China shops, um, selling inexpensive Chinese, uh, Chinese made clothing, um, household goods, consumer projects, children's toys, plastics, <clears throat> faux leather goods, handbags, belts, and the, and the like. Um, and uh, th these are photos of uh, Cyril Dean, which is the second Chinatown in Johannesburg. Um, 
but it's it's probably one of the most bustling Chinatowns. It certainly is is much more active than the Chinatown in Washington D.C. Um, with um, and, and there's enough of a Chinese community now in, in South Africa and Johannesburg to support um, your market gardeners. And so for the first time, you know, when I first moved to South Africa, the um, possibility of getting Chinese food was dismal. It was like worse than worse than worse, chop suey kind of stuff. Um, and with, by the time I left, the, the, the best Chinese food and regional cuisine, you know, so from, you know, Sichuan hot pots to um, northern um, kind of dumplings and, um, and noodles and things like that, and um, farm, farm market farmers that are, you know, selling Chinese vegetables. Um, and you're starting to see some of this stuff appearing in the um, grocery stores as well. And then um, increasingly, um, kind of moving up the, the chain um, in terms of economic activity, you see investments in property development, um, Chinese buying um, shopping centers. Again, this is in South Africa, where I think you've got a, a much larger and critical mass of Chinese. And so you see a much more diversified kind of um, population, um, both in terms of region where they come from, as well as educational, professional level, um, and things. Um, so it's, it's continues to grow. Um, it, well, it was continuing to grow until about a couple years ago. And recently, there have been some articles coming out, um, in part because of the um, the devaluation of the rand, um, but also, you know, in, in other African countries, um, impacts of China's economic slowdown. Um, the um, certainly in Angola and Nigeria, the drop in the price of oil. So you, um, so you're seeing kind of a slowdown and and um, a number of Chinese leaving leaving those countries. Um, we haven't. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research yet to um, be able to track whether they're actually returning to China or if they're going on to some other um, destination. Um, but that's something that's that's worth paying attention to. Um, so this is still relatively early days. Most of the um, new Chinese migrants started appearing on the continent. Um, in, in the late 1990s. Um, there were smaller numbers that came from Hong Kong earlier, um, certainly from Taiwan to South Africa. There was a, a movement during the apartheid era. Um, but the, the large numbers of the new Chinese migrants from mainland China that you see um, on the continent today only started arriving um, in significant numbers um, post 2000. Um, and I would argue that it would actually be kind of post-2005, 2006, um, where you see larger and larger numbers. But um, so that said, you're talking about, um, you know, trying to gauge impacts of uh, groups of people on multiple countries, right, 54 different countries, um, who have been there for maybe 10, 15, 20 years um, about. Um, 25 years and on on the outside so again this is why I still call it preliminary impacts um, in terms of social impacts you'll see um, evidence uh, um, in South Africa and Johannesburg in particular of Chinese presence or influence in physical spaces and patterns of food consumption um, public events festivals language and business linkages so um, again I mean in the in the Period that I lived in in Johannesburg um, from ninety five to twenty ten, um, there was nothing ever that looked like this, right? And these are are kind of developments that have come up: um, lions, dragons, even bilingual signage. And this is all in the area called Cyrildine, um, which is called the second Chinatown. There's actually a first Chinatown, which my husband dubbed China Two Block, because that's about as long as it was um, in the um, commercial business district, the downtown area of Johannesburg that had um, has actually been there since um, 1898, 99. Um, and, but that was home to the Chinese South Africans. And then when the new um, Chinese started coming in, they um, started um, kind of renting um, and buying up property along a, 
uh, an area in a formerly predominantly Jewish part of town not far from the airport. Um, and, you, and, and within about 10 years, you started seeing things like this. Um, there was a big hullabaloo, I think about a year, a year and a half ago, about Chinese um, being taught in South African schools. Um, and um, that whether through um, Confucius Institutes or private tuition um, in South Africa and many other African countries, a lot of Africans kind of are, are looking to the future and looking at economic, um, you know, where they might be able to find jobs and, and, and you know, where the growth is. And they're learning Chinese. Um, uh, there's... Um, Amongst the Chinese migrants who are in South Africa, I only came across one who was fluent in Sesotho, um, and he had uh, he was uh, originally from Taiwan. He'd moved there as a teenager with his family. Um, when his family decided they were going to go back to Taipei, he decided he wanted to stay and try his hand at business, and so he stayed. Um, and he was nicknamed, he was given this local nickname by his customers, basically. I mean, he's been ad adopted into the community, and he jokes around with them in Susutu. Um, but as I said, he was one of, you know, dozens who I interviewed who'd actually made an effort to, um, to learn the local language. Um, the other thing that I noticed with... Um, with language um, that was starting to happen was um, in the factories. Um, in Lesotho, um, there are uh, the, the, the largest employer after the government are these Taiwanese owned garment factories. Um, and uh, there are dozens of them in Lesotho um, that employ um, tens of thousands of, of Basotho women. And in the factories, it was really interesting because. Um, I asked, and even some of these um, people, um, the Chinese who'd been there for years, still didn't speak very fluent English. Um, a lot of the locals um, never really learned Chinese. And what was so fascinating to me was watching them on the on the shop floors, and they were speaking this kind of mishmash of English, uh, Sisutu, and Chinese, um, much like the language that was invented. Um, for the mines in South Africa, Fanagalo, which was, um, you know, very limited in terms of, of the number of, of words, but um, con consisted of a combination of several African languages, Afrikaans, English, um, and stuff. And then the other point I wanted to make about language was the term Fong Kong. Now, this is something that's used um, throughout Southern Africa, except in Zimbabwe, where they call it Jingjiang. They're not real words, but they've become so used that they've be they, that they've been ab adopted by the media, by marketing companies, um, and such, so that you see it um, in newspaper headlines. Fong, Fong Kong is just a combination of fake and Hong Kong. It was popularized in a South African rap song. Um, and it basically alludes to anything that's fake or phony and cheap. Right, so when people talk about Fong Kong, they're talking about the inexpensive Chinese goods that are brought in, right? And 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 now you see it everywhere. It's it's a word, right? In in the South African dictionary, it's been adopted, right, to to mean all of these things. So um, it's fabulous to see something actually just happen before your eyes, you know, while you're living there. Uh, <laughs> Um, so in terms of economic impacts, I know, um, you know, most of you will probably hear from other speakers about kind of the, um, kind of more large scale, um, econo economic, um, transactions and, and engagements, um, right? So you've got, um, investments coming in, um, from China, right? And when people say China, it might be, um, from a state owned company or Chinese government, but oftentimes it's not a a national state-owned enterprise, but a provincial state-owned enterprise, um, and oftentimes it's private sector. So I think 
um, one of the good practices to, to kind of adopt um, in, in any case, but certainly in um, terms of looking at anything as controversial as Chinese engagement in Africa was to kind of be very clear which China you're talking about and which Africa. Because relations, writ large, really depend on our, our ability to distinguish um, who those actors are. Um, so you've got investments, um, large and small. Um, you've got a lot of trade taking place, and most of it is, is natural resources going out and finished goods coming in. And finished goods being you know, both Chinese, the, the Chinese-made um, cheap consumer goods, but also more and more white goods. Um, small appliances, um, electronics, um, and things like that. Um, and, and there are con concerns attached to these kinds of exchanges, right? I mean, and this, this is where I think arguments about China's neocolonial behavior or neocolonial relationship with Africa resonate because of the, the incredible power imbalances that you see. Um, so there, you know, obviously trade imbalances. Um, China, China, again, big China, often gets blamed for job losses and deindustrialization in Africa because of the influx of cheap um, Chinese clothing and shoes, um, particularly. Um, but again, I, I would argue that those kinds of arguments need to be dissected um, and and and. Um, looked at more closely. Um, there are concerns about, again, you know, if we go back to the labor issue, limited job creation, um, and then, or job creation with, you know, the attendant labor issues that often come, um, and then concerns about um, limited uh, skills and tech transfer, and then the long-term Im implications for any kind of manufacturing in, um, in Africa. So you see various kinds of investment from like big corporates like Sino Steel to small little mom and pop shops where you know an individual is importing you know containers or not even containers you know they'll they'll take up um, a quarter of a container to ship boxes of shoes or lingerie, um, but for many Chinese migrants this is still more profitable than doing what they were doing at home. Um, we didn't interview many of them, but I actually interviewed a Chinese professor of physics, right? He was a professor. He said, and, and, and he was living in Johannesburg um, at a little stall in one of these big Chinese, um, uh, big warehouse distribution wholesale outlets, selling women's lingerie. And this wasn't something that he was particularly happy about, right? Professionally, you know, being an a astrophysics professor versus selling, you know, ladies' bras. But he said he was making like 10 times more money this way. And, you know, if you're thinking about, um, you know, preparing for the future and providing for your family, this was, uh, you know, a, a decision that he was happy to make. Um, again, China Construction Bank in Johannesburg. Um, increasingly, there is Chinese investment in manufacturing. Um, I was just in Addis Ababa last week, um, and one of the field trips we took was to the Eastern Industrial Park where the Chinese have worked, um, the Chinese government, um, actually Chinese firms, both private and um, SOE, have partnered with the Ethiopian government to um, open up um, these kind of special economic zones and other um, kind of industrial development um, areas just outside Addis. Um, I think the Ethiopian government spokesperson who spoke to us um, said that there were close to 20 similar parks like that of, diff of varying sizes but huge. The one factory in this huge industrial park that we visited was the famous Huajian um, shoe factory. 6,000 jobs that they were able to create within about four years um, from, from the start of negotiations to today. Um, so there is some job creation, but you know, as I walked away from that field trip, I had all kinds of questions about you know, what kind of jobs are these? You know, it's $3 a day. Um, you know, 
Ethiopia has no minimum wage standards. They're giving, they're, they're giving all of this stuff away to anyone who's willing to invest, um, including, you know, they're building these industrial parks. They're providing, um, you know, all kinds of in incentives and sub subsidies in order to create the jobs that they can't create themselves, right? So um, this is in Lesotho, and this is a Taiwanese clothing factory. Um, are you guys having somebody come and talk about a Goa? Shit. Um, all of the manufacturing that's going on um, in Lesotho, in Ethiopia, a lot of it is being imported to the United States under the Goa. Um, under the African Growth and Opportunities Act. So it's, it's, it's um, allowed to come in um, duty-free, basically, as a preferred, um, kind of because this is a preferred country. So it's, uh, the idea, ostensibly, is to help um, industrial development in Africa, right? But it's Chinese and Taiwanese-owned firms that are, are doing it. So there, there's like a lot of food for thought there, right? Um, there are also this, um, these companies here, 777 Jackpot, and this one, these are also manufactured locally. These are, in South Africa, it's called a Jiko, Jika. It's just a little, um, you put charcoal, and uh, it's a cooker, an outdoor cooker. Um, but these are also local Chinese, um, so this is Chinese migrants, right, who've, who've been in South Africa now for 15, 20 years, um, have kind of started off in a little shop and made enough money to start a small factory, and the factories have now grown, but they're manufacturing not for export, but for local consumption, um, things that, um, that are very useful in, in South Africa and Southern Africa. So one of the things that hasn't been studied in as much detail um, that I... Um, that I hope will be studied at some point. Um, and if, if there's any development economists in the room who want to do this with me, I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, but oftentimes when you, you get the big figures, the numbers of investment, the, the figures of trade, they include kind of its, um, its foreign direct investment, right? It's, it's the big numbers that you get. But you seldom see numbers of Chinese migrant activities that are taking place on the ground. So you don't hear about Chinese migrants who have permanent residents who are investing money in property development and starting these factories. Um, and I think there's a lot more going on there that um, takes place kind of under the radar, if you will, because there's no way to kind of calculate some of this stuff. Um, so there, again, you have job creation, you've got lots of rental income, um, and uh, sim uh, stimulation of, of additional retail and wholesale activities that oftentimes take place in the informal sector, right? If you think about all of the people who are hawking on the streets at every single intersection in Johannesburg, and I imagine in, you know, other cities in Africa, um, all of the things that they're selling are made in China. And the only reason they're able to do that, like engage in those kinds of activities, is because there's now a lot of cheap stuff to be bought and sold um, on the streets. So again, in countries where there's, um, you know, where job, uh, where unemployment is such a huge problem, I would argue that that this is one positive impact um, that that. Chinese goods are having on the continent, but that haven't really been calculated into the overall picture of economic impacts. Um, and then I would uh, kind of end this section with a quote from Deborah Baudigam, the colleague and friend from um, one of her earlier writings. She said, might the increased Chinese presence play a positive role by providing a model of, for low-tech industrial development stimulating the spin-off of manufacturing or acting to jumpstart local investments. So here she's talking about that flying geese model, right? About whether or not the Chinese activities that are taking place might be a stimulus to more local activities. Um, and here you see a lot more. This is here at the bottom, this is, this is Tabo's. So this is a huge um, kind of open, like a grocery store. But he was also selling kind of 
local pumpkins that were grown five miles down the road, right? Um, and and um, and he didn't charge rent, but these um, these uh, African women who are selling kind of fried uh, fat cakes or um, you know a little kind of uh, pop up um, barbecue. Um, on the street, right? And because there's so much traffic going in and out of, of Tabos, these guys can also make a living there, right? Um, this was interesting. The rest of this sign said Portuguese market and bakery, which was now owned by a Chinese guy. <laughs> so, um, okay, and then the last section um, I'll just go through quickly. Um, in terms of political impacts, um, obviously kind of at the high end of things, you see um, Chinese uh, officials dealing with um, the political elite in African countries. Um, and in South Africa, um, as I imagine in many other countries, um, you see kind of civil society and opposition political um, parties um, kind of taking issue with the closeness of ties between the ruling party and the Chinese. Um, are the relations too close um, is, is the question that comes up again and again and again in South African papers, right? And certainly the um, issue, I don't know for those of you who follow South Africa or Southern Africa in, um, uh, about the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama applied for visas, and three separate inst instances he was denied, or they were, there was such foot dragging that he wasn't able to go. And um, none of these visits were official states' visits. One of them, he was invited to Desmond Tutu's birthday celebrations. Um, and there, again, there was all kinds of, of, of speculation about the Chinese, had the Chinese embassy or the Chinese consulate put pressure on home affairs to deny the Dalai Lama his visa, right? And so there, you know, anytime something like this happens, the, the papers in South Africa go crazy. There are all kinds of op-eds, but um, ultimately there was also kind of criticism, not just of this incident, but also of China and China's non-democratic practices, right? He was denied those three times? Three times. Well, the, the one time it wasn't denied, but by the time, you know, they never processed it. He, 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 he didn't end up going because... To the birthday. Yeah. I mean, no, he, he didn't come, any of those instances. So, yeah, it was huge, huge, right? And again, is this, you know, just too much pressure? Is it the Chinese government that's putting this kind of pressure on South Africa? Or is it the South Africans saying, we can't defend the Chinese who are, you know, who have become such an important trading partner, right? I mean, and, and these are the kinds of, of concerns in terms of political pressures, political impacts, right? Um, Criticism about Fang Kang Zuma is linked to China, his ties, um, very chummy to China and Chinese business interests. And um, this last image I wanted to show you was, now, <laughs> everyone knows that I've been doing this whole China thing. So um, actually a friend sent this to me um, and um, I, got, I got the Fang Kang Zuma poster. Somebody actually went and snatched it off of a, a street post and, and brought it to me at a, at a conference. But this begs all kinds of questions, right? Because if you, if you can only read Chinese, it's likely that you're not a South African citizen and you're not voting. So who is this for? Is my question, right? I mean, who was behind this? Again, is it, you know, some... A and C, um, you know, kind of person who's kind of trying to curry favor with the Chinese and and win more votes, you know, for them. Is it is it some Chinese businessman who's trying to win a government project and doing this? I mean, for whatever reasons, this is just wrong, right? Because it's not. It, again, you know, if you think about. The length of time that the Chinese have been in South Africa, um, the number of Chinese who have become citizens and can vote, it just doesn't make sense in terms of in terms of the vote, right? So this is clearly about political influence. Which official is that? That's that's Zuma. Oh. Yeah, no, that's that's Jacob Zuma, the leader of that country. Um, so, 
I just have a couple more slides. Um, so I would just say, in short, the complexity of African-Chinese relations argue, um, today argues against any simple, single explanation or interpretation. There are contradictions between the warmth publicly um, ex expressed by African government leaders and officials with the elites um, from Beijing, but a lot more complex responses that you, you're starting to get from um, from you know, uh, other elements of African societies, um, especially traders and, and labor and, um, and people in Southern Africa in particular who are concerned about democracy and human rights. Um, Chinese migrants continue to arrive, but, and many of them that I've talked to appear to be staying. I mean, one of the interesting things was when I was doing this research um, a few years back, every Chinese person that I talked to said, you know, they're they said they're going to go home. They're going back to China at some point. As far as they were concerned, they weren't immigrants. They didn't move to South Africa. They didn't move to Zambia to stay permanently. That wasn't ever their intention at the outset. But, you know, five years later, 10 years later, they're still there. And, if, and, and I promise you, if their kids are growing up there, then it's the chances are it's pretty likely they're gonna are your, your kids are American right we were talking about how long <laughs> um, people have been it in, in in Ithaca in um, in the United States right I mean you, you're not going to be able to get them to move um, as I mentioned earlier um, there seem to be some indications that um, some Chinese are leaving because it's no longer profitable for them to to stick around the rand's been dropping in value for a long time you know for a year or two you might be able to withstand that kind of of, of um, profit loss but when it looks like it's you know going to be forever then you know people have to make some hard decisions um, but Clearly, you need we, we need to continue to do this research to figure out like you know if they're staying and whether or not any of the impacts that I've talked about are going to be lasting. Um, beyond the preliminary impacts, I think you know I certainly have more questions than answers. Um, for example, in terms of migration, how much responsibility does Beijing bear in terms of encouraging migration? Um, and then one of the things that many Chinese um, that I Talk to in South Africa, um, and and anecdotes from other researchers who are travel uh, who are doing research in other parts of the continent would come and say to me was, um, you know, well you're American, you know, and if anything ever happens to you, your embassy will protect you, right? I mean, the Chinese embassy doesn't care about us, right? And so there are lots of complaints, especially from the Fujianese, who felt like you know they're not the type of migrant that China wants to see representing China overseas, right? And so they were basically saying, you know, until something tragic happens, they don't want to see us. They don't want to have anything to do with us. We don't get invited to, you know, official events um, and things like that. And, and we've seen now in Libya and um, other places, Chinese employees of Chinese firms being um, attacked or um, in Nigeria it's happened, in um, Ethiopia it's happened where the, where the Chinese are targeted because they're Chinese. They're either kidnapped, um, oftentimes just in the crosshairs because they happen to be in um, places where um, there's um, civil strife going on and things like that. But there's a big question in the minds of a lot of the Chinese migrants themselves and the Chinese workers is, you know, is my government going to protect me? The Ghanaian um, mine workers, they were um, all kind of gathered up and deported and the Chinese embassy um, footed the bill for that. Um, but that's a question. Um, is there any sort of neocolonial or imperial aspect to these flows of Chinese people to Africa? Um, and again, hearkening back to the title of Howard French's book, right? China's Second Continent. Um, are these Chinese people a sign of, um, of this kind of Im imperial or neocolonial behavior? There's clearly an imbalance of power. Um, I'm teaching a class now on China, Africa, and I showed them um, the documentary. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Um, is When China Met Africa, um, written by... The, um, produced by the Francis brothers. Um, it's, it's a little bit 
uh, it, it was, it came out in 2007 or eight. So it's, um, it's been a while, but it's still, um, very timely, I think, um, because it asks these questions following three, um, actors in, um, Zambia. One is a Chinese farmer who's an independent farmer. Um, the second is the, um, Chinese, uh, supervisor foreman of a Chinese provincial construction firm that's been hired to, to build a road. And then the third is a Zambian um, official, a government official. And, and kind of it, it tells the story of, you know, China, Africa through these three um, stories. But there's a scene in the, in the movie where um, the Zambian official is on, uh, on his way with um, his Chinese host to a, um, a, the provincial capital of I can't remember which which province, but they're asking him, the Chinese guys, what's the population of Zambia? And he says 13 million. And and the Chinese guy repeats, 30 million? No, no. And the Zambian says 13, one, three. And he kind of, the Chinese official kind of chuckles and says to his colleague, huh, like, and our province, and just our province, they're over 60 million, right? So in, in that little snippet, you see the, the kind of attitude, right, and, and power imbalance there, um, you know, not just in terms of the population, but in terms of the size of economies and, and, and you know, how, how can, I mean, on the one hand, China kind of comes to Africa and says, you know, this is about win-win and partnerships, but how, how equal can these partnerships ever truly be, right? So in that, that aspect of, of the argument about neo-colonial behavior, certainly in terms of the imbalance of power, is, is something that is attractive. Um, but um, then the other question is, you know, what's China's intent, right? Um, questions about imperialism and, and um, what it means um, in, in the context of what China is doing and um, is, is a completely different question. Um, the other thing in terms of power dynamics that I think we need to be mindful of is, um, is that Chinese migrants stick out the way I used to stick out when I first moved to South Africa, right? And people can see you, they find you. So the fact that you have this easily distinguishable um, minority community, migrant community in a country. So even if their if their home country of China is powerful as a migrant in a foreign country, how much power does an individual have? Do they walk around, you know, like I'm Chinese the way many Americans might, <laughs> or is something different going on? Right? I think, and I, I think, you know, it's is this question of how does race play out in different African countries and how does the individual Chinese migrant, how, how is he or she impacted by these dynamics that take place up here, right? Um, and then again, as a migrant scholar, my big questions are, how do we talk about these people, right? I mean, it, as far as I'm concerned, they're not immigrants. My parents were immigrants. They moved here, they were gonna, you know, stay and raise their kids in America. Um, I imagine many of your parents were the same way, right? But in South Africa or in, in any part of Africa, when you go and talk to the Chinese, they're there as far as they're concerned temporarily. So are they sojourners? If we go back to the word that was used to describe many um, Chinese migrants of previous generations, right? Um, of the early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, and then that term expat seems to only be reserved for people who work for the, you know, commercial bank or, or something, right? But for some reason, it's not also used to cover the, you know, poor Chinese peasant from Fujian who's running a little shop in a um, podunk town, you know, like one of your small towns next to Ithaca, right? <laughs> um, you know, how do we refer to them and how do we start thinking about their role in these societies, about mobility in general, about identity. Um, where's home? Where do their uh, loyalties lie? And the question that I started my PhD dissertation with was, you know, where's home for these Chinese people who live in Africa? Can Africa, 
ever be their permanent home? Will Chinese ever truly be considered African, right? These are, are some of the, the questions that I leave you with. So I think that's it. My details are there. And